Here we are in the Law Library of Maryland. This is the repository of all the books that compose the legal structure for our state. And of course, every state in the Union has a law library and it's open to the public. It's one of those uh, resources that a citizen can uh, delve into. But just look at the vast number of books here. I mean, I couldn't imagine that any living human being would have the time to read through everything mm -hmm. that's in this one law library. Mm -hmm. It's an enormous amount of material. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, some of these are, are fascinating. I'd love to read some of the historical works that are presented here time of the war between the states and, wow. and the history that, it, that is presented. Wow. But uh, yeah, some of these are rather old oh, volumes as well. Yeah. But what I want to show you in particular has to do with what we talked about earlier with the uh, Declaration of Independence as uh, the foundation of law in our land. Uh, many have falsely said that the Declaration is not law. Well, I'm going to show you when we look at the U.S. Code that it is indeed the law. Let's go this way. Actually, if we turn right into this carol here, we find the U.S. Code. But if we go to the very first volume, all the way down here at the bottom, Volume 1 of the United States Code, the official laws of these United States, and we have the table of contents, but immediately following the table of contents, notice what is the very first thing, the organic laws of the United States of America. And the first of the organic laws of the United States of America is the Declaration of Independence, 1776. No it is in volume one, and it, in fact, it's the very first page of volume one. So those who would tell us that somehow the Declaration is not the law of these United States, here's the evidence that that is not the case. This is the organic laws of the United States of America. Here in the Law Library of Maryland, which is the law library you would find in any state, this same volume, the United States Code, the official document of the laws of these United States, and there it is, the Declaration of Independence, is the law of the land. Well, let's take a look at some of the books that we've pulled off the shelves here, looking at the history of law, not only for our United States, but also for the state of Maryland. Let's take a look. Margaret, this is Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England, and his commentaries on the laws of England were what were the authority to our founders in understanding not only English common law, but understanding what law actually was. And it's fascinating because William Blackstone does give us three categories of law in his writings here. And by the way, all of our founders read Blackstone's commentaries. Some of them actually studied under him, but you would say even if they didn't study under him directly, they were his students, his disciples, because they took these volumes here of, of Blackstone's commentaries, and these were to them the training that they received in order to practice law. And he said there was actually three types of law. The first he spoke of was uh, the laws of nature. And that phrase should be very familiar because that's exactly what our Declaration of Independence has, the laws of nature. He said the laws of nature were what God has written on the heart of every human being, which actually, interestingly enough, corresponds with what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 2, where he said that on, on every human's heart, God has written his law. Mm -hmm. We call it conscience, mm -hmm. but uh, Blackstone calls it the laws of nature. The second category Blackstone spoke of is uh, revealed law. And he clearly says here that revealed law was given only in the scriptures. So you have the combination of these first two, human conscience that God has written on the heart of every man, and the Bible that God has given to us in printed form. Mm -hmm. Those are the two foundations of law. And then he said there was a third form of law, municipal law. And municipal law is when a legislature meets and they write out a bill and they propose this bill. If it passes and it goes in, it's signed by the executive branch and they say it becomes law. That municipal law, Blackstone said, is only valid if it complies completely with the first two categories, wow. the laws of nature and the laws of uh, revealed law in God's word. Or, as they said in the Declaration, Declaration of Independence, they altered that second phrase just slightly. They altered it in order to make it parallel to the first phrase, the laws of nature, conscience, and the laws of nature's God, which are the Bible. So those two standards are what our founders believed King George III had violated. They said, here's 28 things listed there in the Declaration of Independence, 28 ways King George was violating the laws of nature and revealed law, in spite of the fact that some of what uh, the king had, had done was actually, on paper, law. That 
Parliament had passed a piece of legislation, the king had signed it, it had become law in their system, but our founder said, no, 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 that is pretended legislation. In fact, they use that exact mm -hmm. term in our Declaration of Independence. Pretended legislation, pretended offenses. Why? Not because the king had signed it. It was pretended because it violated the laws of nature and the laws of nature's God. Mm -hmm. So our founders believe very clearly in that fixed standard, an unchanging standard, and William Blackstone was the one who taught them that, as he had himself thought and, and uh, contemplated what, uh, what not only the universe clearly communicated, but what God, through his revealed word, had communicated to man. Margaret, here we have Black's Law Dictionary. This is particularly the ninth edition. If we want to understand what words mean in terms of the legal context, we need to refer to the law dictionary to understand that because some ways in which we might use words in uh, common parlance would not apply in terms of how they're used legally. So, for example, we were talking earlier about the uh, uh, contrast between inalienable and unalienable. And uh, if we look here in the ninth edition, not transferable, this is inalienable, not transferable or assignable, uh, as in inalienable property interests, and here it says also termed unalienable. So we'll turn to unalienable and uh, contrast to see if there's any distinction between those two. There it is. <laughs> it says it see inalienable. Unalienable see inalienable. So in current definition, these two terms are synonymous, as uh, this law dictionary clearly shows. So looking at law dictionaries, the interesting thing that we see is we uh, go generation to generation. You can go back and compare what the terms meant to our founders in, in contrast to how they're used today. Uh, some of the earliest law dictionaries, Bouvet's law dictionary was uh, uh, closer to our founders era um, and uh, it's, it's interesting to see the changes that have taken place in the meaning of words over that course of time. This is the United States reports. This contains a record of each of the cases, in other words the opinion of the Supreme Court in each of these cases. I just want to look at two cases as a quick example of how things change and the odd phenomenon that when the Supreme Court rules, we commonly today say, well, that's the final, that's mm -hmm. the final thing. The Supreme Court said it, that's never going to change forever. Mm -hmm. Well, here's two cases where it illustrates that's not the way it is, that precedent, as we have been told, uh, changes over time mm. and so in a sense we don't know what the future is going to hold regarding what, cons what is considered law today may not be law tomorrow and mm -hmm. vice versa in contrast with our founders who, were, who had a fixed standard they were operating from. One case here um, was uh, Dred Scott. This case arose as a result of the Fugitive Slave Act that said when a slave escaped from his master in the south and went north that did not make him free from bondage. In fact, he was chattel property that could be recovered in those northern states. And so uh, there were slave catchers who literally were traveling in the northern states trying to catch anyone who was a runaway slave. Wow. And uh, the Dred Scott case was an illustration of, well, do they have the right? Once they cross that line into free country, free states, are they now free? And the Dred Scott case basically said, no, they're still chattel property that can be recaptured uh, where they are and they can be restored to uh, their master in the South. Wow. So the Supreme Court here in this decision was saying, well, uh, the slaves do not have the rights that other citizens have under the Constitution. They are property. They don't have any any rights at all. Mm. Now, that's quite in contrast to what we see today then and, and saying, no, 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 there's no one who should be denied his rights based upon condition of uh, employment, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you're employed as a household servant, that doesn't mean you mm -hmm. lose your rights as a human being or that you have no rights. So here's a decision the Supreme Court made and we have certainly not followed this decision as precedent in our mm -hmm. day. Uh, we have followed other decisions that we say, well, those uh, supersede that decision. Another uh, case that uh, this was uh, later in time in the 19th century, uh, 1896, is Plessy v. Ferguson. And in this case, it was a debate about uh, segregation that had taken place in the South. That uh, uh, although the, the slaves were freed, they were not permitted to travel in the same train car or permitted to use the same bathrooms and a whole series of things in terms of segregation that took place. And the question presented here to the Supreme Court was, is that legal? Is it legal to have a separate facility 
for one race of people from the other race of people, and those two races have to be kept separate. And it's interesting that Plessy v. Ferguson, the decision was made here to say separate but equal is legal. Mm. So you can have a water fountain for whites and a water fountain for blacks, and that's perfectly legal. There's nothing wrong with that at all. So that mm. kind of, well, some would maybe call it apartheid, but that kind of segregation was accepted, and this case said that that is the law. Now, wait a minute. Today we say that is illegal. It's mm. not right to have a segregation based upon the color of a person's skin, and so we have overturned Plessy v. Ferguson. Ferguson is, Plessy v. Ferguson is no longer the precedent that our legal system looks to to say that's the authority. And so the illustration we have, just these two cases, we could cite uh, many other cases as well, illustrates what happens when you move away from the fixed standard that our founders constructed a, a republic upon, a fixed standard of law that does not change over time. And, you know, they said two plus two equals four, it will always equal four. That's the laws of mathematics, the laws of chemistry. Uh, you mix certain quantities mm -hmm. of certain chemicals, this is what's going to happen. This is the mm -hmm. reaction you will get. The laws of chemistry are immutable. They're part of the universe. Mm -hmm. Our founders believed that the moral laws of the universe were as unchangeable as those physical laws. Mm -hmm. And therefore, thou shalt not steal. There's still thou shalt not steal. Mm -hmm. A thousand years from now, it'll be the same. A million years, it, it's part of the universe. It does not change. Mm -hmm. And so that when you move away from that fixed standard, then you have something such as we're illustrating here of a changing standard. At one point in time, one thing is legal, and then a few years later, it's the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a bill signed by Thomas Jefferson, who was the Secretary of State. It, it created the mint. And notice it says that being Congress of the United States uh, at the third session, so this is when George Washington was president, at the third session of Congress being held at the city of Philadelphia. We already mentioned that for a period of time, Congress was at Annapolis, but it was also at Philadelphia and, and New York. There was a, not a, a permanent seat of government, you might say, in terms of uh, our system, and perhaps that was a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, here's the uh, a beautiful uh, rendition because we see Thomas Jefferson's actual a signature when he was Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. Fascinating man, uh, a Renaissance man in a way. Uh, we visited his home there in Monticello. Just amazing, his breadth of interest in all sorts of areas of science and horticulture mm -hmm. and uh, a very accomplished man in many ways. But his greatest accomplishment was probably penning the Declaration of Independence.